everyone to the second half of our day together. I'm Sarah Leadham, uh, one of the event co-chairs, and we're so pleased to welcome you to the keynote plenary uh, featuring Rwandan President Paul Kagame. So thank you all for joining us for this today. As you've already had time to meet together in small sessions and dive a little bit deeper into some of the pressing topics that are facing doing business in Rwanda, today's session in this group will focus a little bit more on one country that has done extremely well in focusing on how to really create open opportunity for people to do business and for those business indicators to, and at the end run, um, support people moving out of poverty and to grow positive education and other positive economic indicators. Um, we'll start the session with a, a, an introduction of the president, and then we'll move into some question and answer time with Stefan Chambers. But first now to introduce the president is Dean Peter Tefano. So welcome again. Uh, Paul Kagame needs little introduction. Um, you're all here because he's here. Um, but for just a little bit of background, President Kagame has served as President Rwanda since 2000. He was chosen as uh, in the first democratic elections in 2003 and re-elected in 2010. Uh, as a president, uh, President Kagame has prioritized national development and has been widely lauded for his, champ for his work around economic stability. Um, recently, here at Oxford, we had the resource conference in July. President Clinton of America was here, and it hailed President Kagame as one of the world's greatest leaders of our time. Tony Blair uh, has called him a visionary leader, and Howard Schultz, chief executive of Starbucks, has persuaded by his persuasion to invest there. A cornerstone of uh, Kagame's recent leadership is Vision 2020, a plan set to move the nation to a middle-income country by 2020. Pillars of this plan include good governance, advancing a knowledge-based economy and private sector development, developing infrastructure, and spurring national-oriented national -oriented agriculture. In the, most review, in the most recent review of the plan's progress, it's ahead of its goals. But instead of stopping at those goals, uh, the Rwandan government has lifted the bar and set higher standards for its economic programs. It's these initiatives that we're looking forward to hearing more about today. And as I said, as many of you may have been present, or some of you may have been fortunate to be present at the resource conference hosted by the Oxford Smith School for Enterprise and the Environment last year, when President Kagame discussed challenges of food security. Today we're going to discuss not food security, but rather economic security and economic growth. We're delighted to have President Kagame to return here to Oxford and to come for the first time, I believe, to the Said Business School. Mr. President, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you for a kind introduction. Professor Peter Tufano Dean Said, Said Business School, Oxford University, distinguished scholars, leaders of business and the media, faculty, staff, and students, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I'm Delighted to be here with you today. It has been said that Africa is the new frontier for business, that it is a continent holding the promise for the global economic turnaround. These are not mere cliches or exaggerated media headlines. They reflect a real sustained trend of witnessed economic growth. The World Bank and other reports indicate that Africa is the second fastest growing region in the world. Nine out of 15 countries in the world with the highest rate of economic growth are in Africa. 
And despite worldwide economic slowdown, African economies have averaged growth rates of 5% over the last 10 years. Still, most aim for double-digit growth in the next decade. In Rwanda, for instance, we are targeting 11.5% annual growth in the next five years. And according to recent surveys, 27 African countries have already reached middle income status, and by 2025, that number would have risen to 40. However, there is no shortage of skeptics where Africa is concerned, who think this growth cannot last. Equally, there are many who are convinced by the evidence that it will last. Among these are those Africans who are driving it and who are resolved to maintain the momentum. The question, therefore, as we look to the future, is not whether this growth can be sustained, but rather of how. To a large degree, the current growth is driven by structural changes within African countries, which means it can and will last. There is increasing political stability and better governance across Africa. Many countries have undertaken reforms that ensure macroeconomic stability and create a better climate for business. In my own country, Rwanda, it takes only six hours to register a business. Indeed, according to foreign policy magazine's 2013 business line, baseline profitability index, Rwanda is the fifth best investment destination in the world. The evidence has also demonstrated that it is not just the resource-rich countries that are witnesses unprecedented growth. The latest figures from Ernest and Young, Young's Africa Attractiveness Survey 2013, indicate that while in the last 10 years, Africa's GDP has tripled, natural resources contributed less than 20% and services nearly 60%. This is partly explained by an increasing shift from dependency on commodities alone to include services and manufacturing as well as growing intra-African and South-South trade and investment. Our countries have also taken deliberate steps to invest in areas that are most sustainable. It's people. Over the past few years, there has been significant effort to invest in human capital specifically education and health. Between 2000 and 2008, secondary school enrollment in Africa increased by nearly 50%, and over the past decade, life expectancy has increased by about 10%. This investment has resulted in increased human capacity, a growing middle class, and rising urbanization, all of which translate into greater 
and diversified domestic demand that will in turn spur economic growth. <coughs> Poverty is evidently declining. According to the World Bank, since 1996, the average poverty rate in sub-Saharan Africa has fallen one percent point, percentage point every year. And between 2005, 2008, uh, 2008, the portion of Africans on the continent living on less than one and a quarter dollars a day fell from fell for the first time from 52% to 48%. In Rwanda, for example, between 2006 and 2011, we reduced the poverty by an estimated 12% and lifted one million people out of poverty. Growth begets growth. And we may add confidence as well. Africans are getting more buoyed by what they see as the bright future of their continent's economies and are more willing to invest in it. The confidence, that confidence is best exemplified in the growing number of large local individual and corporate entrepreneurs spreading their businesses across Africa. According to the market analysis, intra-African investments rose by about 33% in the last five years alone. Over the last few years, the global investment community has demonstrated confidence in Africa's future, leading to an emerging sovereign debt bond market. Some African countries, including Rwanda, have placed debt bond offers on the international market, and many of them have been hugely oversubscribed. In the medium to long term, this relationship with private capital provides a solution to the endemic shortage of investment in large infrastructure projects, which has led to dependency on foreign aid as an alternative, but which foreign aid has also been declining significantly. African capital markets are also increasingly becoming important sources of investment capital. There are 23 stock markets in Africa today, and 15 of them trading daily. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I have dwelt on Africa's transformation and potential because I have witnessed firsthand in Rwanda where we started from a very low base to reach where we are now. Other African countries have experienced a similar economic transformation. Much more can be done because Africa still has a lot of untapped potential. However, Challenges that may impede our growth potential still exist and must be addressed. Many African countries are charting their own way forward, but we recognize that we need to work together and establish partnerships with the private 
industry, business, governments, academia, and non-profit organizations to create lasting prosperity. In the global economy, knowledge is a key driver of growth and development. To get, to get its full benefit, we need to increase investment in the youth, in technology, and innovation, and develop entrepreneurship. That's why partnership with academia is crucial. And the reason Rwanda has partnered with academic institutions, such as Carnegie Mellon University, which has set up a campus in Rwanda to prepare the next generation of IT entrepreneurs and leaders in East Africa. To all our partners, I have always said to them that the real returns on their investment are evident in the many lives whose welfare is positively affected. This will in turn be sustained by the improving business environment, growing markets, increasing disposable income, and readily available labor. Beyond setting up shop, the international private sector can partner with Africa's local communities into win-win relationship that will further sustain these returns and continued regional integration on our continent will also support this. In conclusion, let me emphasize that African economies are growing steadily, but this is only the beginning and will be accelerated in the medium term to reach the level where the continent is stronger and our people wealthier. We need to move faster. Our people are mobilized, motivated, and ready to embrace meaningful partnerships to address the remaining deficits, deficits and meet their full potential. I wish to thank you once again for your kind attention, and I look forward to continued conversation in the way of comments and questions to follow. I thank you very much. Mr. President, um, thank you and welcome. Um, forgive me for about three seconds while I remind our audience please to switch off their telephones, video cameras, recording devices, telescopes, anything else you might have uh, in the room. Um, welcome and thank you for coming to the Said Business School and thank you in particular for agreeing to answer our questions. Um, you very kindly agreed to take some questions from the floor, um, from our delegates and from our students, and we'll get to those um, in a moment. As you know, in this institution, we study leadership, and we study turnarounds. And your country has achieved really astonishing things in the last uh, 19 years. Uh, and let me remind our audience uh, of some of your country's recent achievements. 
a decade ago, two and a half thousand university students, now 76,000 students. That should mean something to those of you in the room. That was, I was reminded of that by Dave King um, an hour ago. 63rd this year in the Global Competitiveness Index. Child mortality down by two thirds in two decades. 95% of boys and 97% of girls enrolled in primary school. 12 years compulsory free education. Significant success in anti-corruption policy. The abolition of the death penalty. 56% of seats in parliament held by women. Widespread immunization programs. And a recent $400 million bond eight times oversubscribed. Okay. Those are real turnarounds, real leaderly achievements. <laughs> and, and we also study here at Oxford and here at Said debate and critique. And as you know better than I, you have critics. And they focus on what they see as your authoritarian style. They focus on relations with the DRC. Aid from countries, including our own here in the UK, was suspended last year. And several multilateral agencies are directly critical of your leadership. Mr. President, how do you answer those who worry that growth at the levels that you've achieved and against the regional backdrop you inherit is simply antithetical to a completely fully-fledged human rights agenda? Well, this is, uh, well, I'm glad you, you, you start with the stories that are, or the story that is backed by numbers and facts. So let me put that aside. Let's go to the other side of the critics, which is largely subjective and not backed by numbers and facts. It's an issue of interpretation. It's an issue of where you come from. But I'll be helped here to explain by saying, if you really look at the real numbers and facts that have evidence for being real and expressed by the people of Rwanda, and then you look at the criticisms also made <coughs> on the other side about us, first of all, they don't add up. You, you, you can't be having this good story first in the first place, backed by evidence and facts and by people of Rwanda. And you also have this other side being true. This is my, start, my starting line of, of argument. So it's Second, not possible for both facts to be true at the same time? I, I don't think so. OK. Yes. <laughs> Because whatever we talk about, whether it is human rights, whether it is democracy, it's about the type of governance, and so it's about people, isn't it? And the people of Rwanda have told you that story, the positive side of the story, which you have already stated. If you're talking about participation of women, even in decision making or in the parliament, 56%, the highest in the world. Well, you have these democracies that have zero participation of women. Is that democratic? I argue that democracy is about people and it's about involvement of people. Does providing education, basic education, for 12 years, including everybody in education, providing education and health care, covering over 90% of the population, is it anti-democracy? Is it authoritarian? If you're providing food security for your people and enabling people <laughs> to feed themselves and they are empowered to do that, how can that be against human rights or democracy? 
So those who say, so those, those who answer your question by saying yes. it is authoritarian yes. or it is undemocratic, yes. is it that they're not in possession of the right facts? Is it that they have an agenda that, that is misguided? Well, I think well, what have, motivates yeah. those critics? They have a confused agenda. Yes. Okay. Put them straight. I, I don't even understand it because and my main focus is about whether I'm delivering for what people of Rwanda hired me to do, right? And if the people of Rwanda are saying we are happy with what we are getting from you as a person we are hired to lead us, then I will not even bother about the critics. By the way, these critics, let me tell you, are mainly coming from outside not from inside. I'll come back to that, I'll come back to that you, point you in a minute. To that. Well, so, let, so let's, so, so let's, let's, yes, let's go to outside it. Rwanda. What, one of the things that will fascinate this audience, I suspect, yes. is whether you, as the architect of this extraordinary, extraordinary turnaround, believe that there's a prescription for other countries on the continent for pulling off what, what Paul Collier, who's sitting down there, calls the, the hat trick of triple growth, poverty reduction and inequality reduction. What are the lessons for, for the other 53, 52 countries? The, 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 the lesson is simply that if Rwanda can come from where it has been and be where it is today, any other country can do it. This is, it's, it's like telling the other Africans that you can also do it. And I have said in my speech mm. that actually many of them are doing it. Mm. There is growth and development taking place as we speak across the continent. There are many countries doing different things, coming from different backgrounds, and having similar and different challenges, but still growing and moving forward. It's a good story. Having a good story does not mean you don't still have many challenges to overcome. Far from that, even in Rwanda, we have overcome many challenges. We still have many challenges to overcome. We, we, we are conscious of that. And we've done that really basically on, on the basis of two things. One is on the basis that our people have been mobilized. They are doing their best, working very hard to deal with these challenges. But we have also had partnerships, even from outside of Rwanda, people who have supported our development process, even with this uh, the kind of confused story I was talking about coming from outside. There are, there are good people, very many <coughs> good people out there who have been very supportive and have been part of the progress we have been making in the country, including the partners we have had in the form of the United Kingdom that has invested in our development. And by the way, again, for these other stories, for any country you know that gets foreign aid, even if last time, as you also alluded to, we saw suspension of it because of a different story which we can go into later on and talk about, there is nobody that disputes that Rwanda accounts for and better utilizes this aid than any country that receives aid. Ted, you, you just raised the question of the suspension of aid. Do you want to tell us about well, it's, why, it's, 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 why I'm saying it is confused. Suspension was not about whether Rwanda's aid received by Rwanda was misappropriated, mismanaged, or done. No. no, it's not because of that. It's because of a political issue, a problem in the neighboring country of Congo, right? And the argument here is how is Rwanda going to be responsible and for how long for what happens in another country that has had a history of problems. Mm. The problems of Congo started before he was born. They are still there. Some of those that started before he was born are still there. They have to do with the governance of the country. This is, this is an issue of Congo to own up and the leaders they are of to deal with. And even these partners who later on when they have failed to do what they are supposed to do, blame it on Rwanda. The world put there a force 
to deal with the problems in the Congo. The UN force that is there has been there for over 12 years. They spend $1.5 billion every year. There is nothing to show for that. And, and having failed to show anything for that, having, I mean, coupled with the failure of the internal situation, which should be blamed on Congo, they have to blame somebody. And that is Rwanda. Okay. <laughs> yes. One of the things we talk about in this institution is something, again, I'm quoting Paul Collier, is the natural resource curse. And if I understand your economy correctly, 43-something percent of it is accounted for by service. Um, do you think that the absence of natural resource um, bonanza creates a more entrepreneurial incentive for your country? Well, I come from a different school of thought. <laughs> I wish I had that curse <laughs> on my side. I would deal with it differently than how others have mismanaged it or how it has mismanaged them. That, that is but my that's thinking. The, that's the, that's, the, that's, that's yes. the definition of the I, I curse, wish, I wish is I how it mismanages them. I wish I could be tested on that. So you're saying it's a, it's a, <laughs> it's a, problem, you, it's a problem you wish you had. Yes, okay. it's a problem. I, I wish okay. I had to manage, but... Uh, okay. I, so I'm going, I'm, going to ch I'm going to change tack very slightly now and, uh, yes. and, and, um, and talk a little bit about you. Uh, you. You famously, or at least I've read, that you sleep for four hours a night. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a recent prime minister in this country, um, uh, um, recently died, Margaret Thatcher, <laughs> who was famous for the same thing. Um, are there any other parallels you might like to suggest to our... <laughs> to, to, uh, to our Prime Minister, um, and particularly if he's worrying about achieving 8% annual growth. Well, mainly it, it is really to focus on the right things. We, we have focused on our number one asset, and that is the people, our people. We have invested in them. We have made sure that they participate and we, we, we run a, 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 an inclusive system where everybody plays their part to the <laughs> level they can, and that's it. The other is concentrating on some of the activities that matter most generally, even to realize this growth. And, and we are happy to make sure that our growth also leads to development. It's not just about growth in, terms of impressive numbers. I mentioned to you how we lifted the people out of poverty 12% in five, six years. So that speaks to the development and how it is linked with the growth. And to achieve this, you have to create an environment where <coughs> enterprise can thrive, small or big. And, and we have pri focused on private uh, enterprise, we, we have brought in the citizens to make sure that they can do trade and do the kinds of savings and investments that can be attained. So maybe from that one can draw some other parallel, uh, I guess. You, you, you talk about your people as your, as your principal asset, and I know that many of them wish you a third term. Have you ruled that out? I haven't even been bothered with it so far myself. It's actually many people around inside of the country and outside for different reasons. Some think it's a good thing if, if I, I stayed on, actually quite many. There are others who think I should, or, or, or others even who think I shouldn't have been there in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> so we, 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 we deal with all of those, but uh, I think... Uh, so that's, we, a, that's a not, not sure yet answer. It's not a not a sure yet. It's, it's just I have to deal with okay. priorities as, as, as they are. I, I don't have to worry about what is coming in four years' time before I'm worried about what is coming the next day. Um, just before we open questions to the floor, I'd like to ask you, Mr. President, one last 
question. You're, you're, you're very famous for resisting the creation of African identity by non-Africans. You're, you're very famous for writing that Africa's history is written by others. Do you think we're anywhere near close to moving beyond that and to creating a more balanced view, in part through events like this, in part through growth, through economic cooperation, in part through partnerships? Well, we have a proverb in, 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 part, in our part of the world, but I, I just shorten it to say, you know, it's better things should start uh, at home. Even for cultural keepers like me, they say before you go so far away to look for good pasture, you, you first deal with what is around your homestead. So I, I don't see how Africa or Rwanda should be defined from so far away rather than starting with what you can do uh, back at home, not only theoretical definition, but the practical one of things we do and must do to, to improve our lives. And do you think that events like this are helping or, or not necessarily? We, like which ones? Like the one we're in today. It is very helpful. It, 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 it links, you see, that in fact, even with the arguments that we get involved in, we are not talking about, again, if you notice in the same speeches that I make, including, you know, speaking out on not being defined from outside, you also find in the same breath that I talk about partnerships. I'm more for partnerships. Uh, so trying to define yourself does not preclude partnership. I, I want yeah. to start from that. So this one is, is the best we can have because it, it brings you know, different parts of the world together to think about what affects not only individual entities but also collectively how we are affected. Absolutely this okay. is the best thing you can have. So it is very helpful. But we have to deal with another reality that also exists. It's about where there are imbalances in this world we live in, where sometimes it has almost come to um, uh, those who are powerful are the ones who should have a say over the weak ones. Okay. And the weak ones are saying, no, I, I think there is a part you have to play for ourselves. So please, respect us as we will respect you. This okay. is the argument I'm involved in every day. Okay, thank you very much. Right. As, a, as a not at all powerful person, I'm now going to uh, ask for questions from the floor. Um, please, if I call you out, um, please uh, wait, if possible, for a microphone. Tell us who you are, and above all, please keep your question brief and in the form of a question. Okay. <laughs> First person, right up there, right next to the microphone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your very impassioned um, presentation. Um, it's good to see a um, very charismatic leader. Um, I agree with all your strides as you articulated. I just want to mention, my name is Halim Abubakri. I'm founding executive director of This Young Minds. I wanted you to comment on the rising inequality in Rwanda, please. Thank you. Well, I don't know where you're getting that from. It's from the Rwandan embassy in America. I just saw it on our website now, that the rising inequality in Rwanda. I, know, I don't have the same reading. <laughs> inequality is decreasing, not increasing. So whoever corrupted the website and put something. <laughs> <laughs> okay. From the story I told you, even by numbers, it's the opposite. Yes. OK, we have a question there. Uh, uh, two in, in the middle, right by the microphone. And then I'm coming down here, and then somewhere over here. Yes. Hello, thank you very much for speaking with us. Um, I'm a lecturer on human rights. Um, in the Vision 2020 document, there's a significant emphasis on unity 
um, and this, you get the sense of the Ubani Rwanda and the national identity. I'm wondering if you can speak to the perceived relationship between national reconciliation, unity, and development um, in Rwanda today. Um, what we do in Rwanda, even within our, our, our vision as stipulated, is, is informed and shaped by our history and experiences there. It's not so long ago we lost one million people. We had a genocide. That was not just a mere disaster that happened. It, it was politically motivated and driven. It has a long history, even linking with the colonial situation. So we are therefore informed by that to say, look, let's do two things. One, we have to deal with the situation as we have it, that it demands justice and reconciliation at the same time. Normally these two tend to conflict, where you have to cut out justice and make sure people are held accountable. At the same time, you, you want also to try and bring them closer together, so there is a kind of conflict, and we have to manage that. At the same time, we also are saying, look, we, 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 in our society, like in other societies, we may have, be different from one another. But the diversity in our society should not be only a source of problems, it should be a source of solutions to our problems. So in other words, let's, let's bring the country together, let Rwandans feel as Rwandans first and foremost, they can feel they are whatever else they are afterwards. And even in being proud and of and feeling that you are different from the other, this should not be a source for any conflict. It's rather that one may complement the other in the differences they have. So this is how we've been approaching it. So we run, on one hand, justice, on the other, reconciliation, then unity that will bring the country together <coughs> to make sure that we, we, we move forward together uh, as well as the, the, the kinds of differences we have within our society being recognized. In the middle here. Yeah. Hi. Um, you mentioned earlier that youth is very important for development. And obviously education is important for the youth to uh, develop. But in my experience of schools in Rwanda visiting, um, the change of language of tuition from French to English uh, seemed to make it very dif difficult for teachers to do their job, given the speed of the change. And, the, um, and so they would, the teachers would struggle to catch up with the language, and as a result, they, they would struggle with the teaching, and children would struggle to learn. Um, suggesting that while teachers learn English, there's going to be some kind of lost generation. Um, I just wonder, in light of all of the positive facts that you've given us uh, so far today, um, whether this might count as a mistake, and whether there might be other facts uh, that could prompt concern about Rwanda's development, um, which you or others could learn from. Thanks. Well, so far, I'll say a couple of things here. So far, most of the things we have done, even under very difficult circumstances, uh, have been bearing results, good results for us. Second is, as I said, we have started from a very low base, almost on everything. And we have been dealing with difficult situations anyway, for, for given where we are coming from. So <coughs> not that we expected anything to be easy for us, and even in education, Again, as I said, we are informed by our own situation. We have not shied away uh, from making the right investments, even where things initially are very difficult, but as long as we are able to see at the other end of the tunnel that there are, there are increased or, or, or significant uh, benefits. So, the change in terms of languages was, was deliberate. It wasn't accidental. And we knew the, the challenges that were involved. 
but I'll give, tell you how we, for example, overcame them. Doing different other things. In, in reforms, say, of our immigration, in the increased integration in our region, the kind of situation we have created in Rwanda has seen people come to Rwanda to work there, actually to fill that gap, even in terms of teaching English in our schools and so on. We have many Kenyans, Ugandans, Tanzanians coming to work in Rwanda, and this is what we want. On one hand, we are filling the gaps and we have in, in the skills area and, and, and knowledge but by having people coming to work for us as we train our own people. And uh, English has linked us with more, by the, we're also members of the Commonwealth now. And it has linked us with the different opportunities across the Commonwealth uh, of countries. And that has come with more benefits than we probably would have had but the start is, is in, inherent and clearly very difficult, but the benefits are, are already showing and, and growing. So I don't think there's a, a much, I mean, a bigger problem uh, than really we envisage to deal with. Could you have done anything differently? I don't know, because what I'm doing is correct, so I think. <laughs> I, I think I need to go on with this. Okay. Um, I have, I'm, I'm being told I have room for one more question. Two more questions, one more question. One last question. Okay, so, so um, I will take an executive decision here and I'll say I'll, I'll take one more question, but it will be a conflation of lots of people's questions. So what I need you to do in order to help me with this is each of you who I point to, give me the, give me the full word version of the question and we'll run them together and ask if the president is prepared to answer them as a job lot, one. What are the key success factors behind Rwanda's red tape initiative? Two. Behind what? The red tape initiative. Red, red tape. tape. Uh -huh. uh, would you comment on Rwanda's relationship with France? Yeah. <laughs> how, would you, how would you characterize the leadership style? Sorry? How would you characterize the leadership style? Uh -huh. And yes, woman, um, blue. Rwanda diaspora. The role of Rwanda diaspora. Okay. Right. I'm afraid that I will be in big trouble if I take any more questions under the one question heading. So, <laughs> Mr. President, we have one final question. <laughs> uh, and it comes in four parts. The first part is, might you be able to comment on the Red Tape Initiative? Yeah. The second part is, might you comment on uh, Rwanda's relationship with France? Yeah. The third part is, might you comment on your own leadership style? Mm -hmm. And the fourth part, I can't read my own writing. What? The Rwandan diaspora. The Rwandan diaspora. Yes. yes. Well, uh, anyway, I always face these difficulties. So, a red tape, we, we deal with the red tape uh, uh, by way of, um, first we have concentrated on building institutions and, and being able to also hold them accountable and be demanding of, of uh, you know, the process to evaluate and see where we are from, where we have come from, and where we, we are going. And, and so we, we, there is a drive mainly, I would say this time, from the top, uh, but more invested in the institutions and making sure that accountability cuts across and, and we make sure that if we have given ourselves the targets, we want to measure how far we are towards that target and somebody should be updating uh, every other responsible person how far we have gone. So that has tended to deal with the problem and that's how we also fight with, uh, and we have the fight against corruption and it's through accountability and making sure that things are transparent and people can be brought in to monitor what is happening. Relationship with France uh, is better than it was a couple of years ago. Uh, where that was uh, is another story. But I think sometimes when uh, no news is good news. So <laughs> we, we, there, is, there is not much in terms of crisis as we have experienced in the past. So we, we, there, there is a potential that we can improve it and, and move forward. But there is certainly a very bad history that goes back 19, 20 years 
from now. Uh, so, and our aim is always to try and overcome or, or, or do away with some of these uh, uh, bad relationships you have had with the people. So that, that's uh, the answer to that. My leadership style, I, I wish somebody else had to define it, but uh, I, I, I believe in, um, first of all, I, 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 I take responsibility for what I have to take responsibility for. Well, today I'm, I'm president of my country. Before I became president, I was something else, and or maybe if I hadn't become president, I would have become been doing something else. But I take what I'm doing seriously. As one, secondly, it's not just me; it's also other people you you, you work with or you serve. That is, in this case, the people. So I have always make sure that there is a connection between my, the responsibilities I have to carry out and uh, those I serve in carrying out these responsibilities. But something that may be controversial or raises questions or whatever, which I'm happy to, to take responsibility for, is that I demand accountability. I give it my all to make sure that I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing and do it the best way, or even accept to be criticized or be held responsible for what I'm supposed to do. But I also hold responsible those others I'm responsible for and make sure that we are doing the right thing and doing it <coughs> the right way. So if that says anything, I, I don't know, then we from there, you can add your own observations. <laughs> Rwanda and diaspora. In fact, this, this evening I have a meeting with uh, thousands of uh, Rwandans oh, in, in town. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think about, they are coming close to 3,000 now, I'm told. And I mean, those ones best here in the UK, but some others from other European countries have also come over and going to meet with them. And it is really built on our desire to make sure that Rwandans are involved in what is happening in the country, not only those who are in the country, but those who are outside, whether they are students or people doing different things, uh, wherever they are. We want to bring them to be part of the development of the country and, and to feel that they've been given their, their, their rightful place and role to play uh, if they so wish. And, and we have seen a very good response anyway. So the, the, Rwandan, uh, the Rwandans living outside of Rwanda have a huge role to play. We recognize that, and we want to make sure they, they really do that. President Kagami, thank you very much for answering our question. Just have our, our team come up quickly. So standing with us now on the on the dais today is the uh, student group that organized this conference. This is the Africa OBN. And on behalf of the entire Africa OBN, we would like to present you with the first inaugural distinction of honor for African growth. And as a, as a community, we took into consideration all of the facts that were presented, which many of you heard. Um, but as students, we're here taught daily about strategy, about operations, about execution, about maintaining metrics and focusing on goals. And in looking at the story of Rwanda, we've seen all of the lessons that we've learned as business students come to bear in the tremendous success that we've seen in Rwanda. Um, and we believe passionately that this is the right time to recognize 
President Kagame for the tremendous work that he's done on behalf of his people. So on behalf of the Oxford Africa OBN, um, please accept this and thank you so much for joining us today. So President Kagami, I think we can have you exit here and the rest of the team here just hang tight for a minute and we'll uh, close up the plenary for a moment. Thank you. Um, so in a few minutes, we're going to go ahead and break. Um, there should be sort of afternoon coffee waiting for you to get you through the rest of the afternoon sessions.